had heard about this area for many years, and finally I was able to plan a visit. In addition to seeing flowers and maybe get some bird watching done, I wondered who J.J. Collette was and why the place was named after him. To find out, we have to dive into Alberta's relatively recent history. Let's go! Our journey started off with a trek through some shady pine trees. After hastily putting on a layer of bug spray that seemed to do nothing, I found myself wondering if the place even had a map of all its trails. We walked for a few minutes and came to a clearing that finally had an actual trailhead and a map. Yeah, there's a lot of trails. Probably this might be the most interesting. Yeah. I think I was a little overwhelmed at the number of options. The natural area covers 635 acres and contains 18 kilometers or 11 miles of trails. The area was once owned by the Canadian Pacific Railway and at one time had a sawmill and Chinese laborers working on the CPR used the area as a camp. Joe Collette was an officer in the RCMP and was posted at Fort McLeod in southern Alberta. One of his duties was to recover stolen horses in the Morningside area. Within the boundaries of the natural area are rails from the corrals which he used to pen the horses after recovering them. After Joe retired from the RCMP, he lived at Pigeon Lake and would relive his experiences with his son, Jack Collette, by walking the old wagon trail. Jack Collette, whose memorial plaque is featured here, purchased the land in 1951 and operated a ranch until 1974. He then sold a portion of the land to the Alberta Wildlife Foundation with assistance from the provincial government. The site was then designated as a natural area and named in memory of Jack's son, John Joseph Collette, or JJ Collette, who loved the area and became a wildlife technician, but tragically died in a forestry accident when he was 19. The area is well known for its abundant wildflowers, insects, and wildlife. You can see some sort of cocoon here. Unfortunately, it was too late in the year to see many birds, but there were a lot of wildflowers blooming. Like my other videos, I've identified what I can, and I do apologize if I've misidentified anything. And some of the areas are a bit sandy. This swamp, even though it looks quite still and silent, was bustling with the quiet sound of water beetles and other insects. To me, it sounded like a bowl of rice krispies, softly crackling and snapping. Here's another angle from which you can see the activity almost like raindrops on the water's surface. Near the pond was a large patch of fireweed in bloom.
we can hear the QE2 highway in the distance. It's not very far away, unfortunately, but still very peaceful here. Like fireweed. There is a police car moss on that fireweed there. On the fireweed, I spotted a police car name, also known as the Green Lattice. The latter name makes me think of a superhero. It's a fairly large moth with striking colors and is unusual in how it's active during the day. I've never actually seen them awake. They've always been asleep every time I spot them. This is a real treat. I've also seen these moths at Bunchberry Meadows and Glory Hills, which I'll post the links above and in the description box below. I had never seen so many before in one place. Maybe it's a nod to Joe Collette policing the area so many years ago. Because of all the trails, the area is quite well marked with signs. But you have to remember what number you're intending to walk on. Oh, he is awake. Don't see him. Spoiler alert, these guys are gonna keep showing up. Police car moth. We reached a grassy clearing, which gave us a break from the mosquitoes, but now we have the hot sun beating down on us. It also let us have a glimpse of a variety of butterflies in the area. Here's a couple more police car moths with some sort of skipper. Because the area was ranched in the past, it is still returning to a natural state with more natural vegetation. One of the signs mentioned there is still a fair amount of bluegrass. I was also fascinated by the wild roses. Some had interesting patterns on the petals, like this one. Later we'll see some almost white ones. I'll admit, I've kind of given up on trying to identify the actual species of wild roses, just because they all look so similar. Here's a rare cluster of wild sarsaparilla berries. They usually get eaten quite quickly and taste great despite the big seeds being in them. We reached another boardwalk over a marshy area.
And here are some of the other pollinators of the natural world, some wasps and some flies. of starry Solomon seals showed off their striped berries at the foot of a tree. This tree looks like it's undergoing a bit of stress, judging by the sap oozing down the trunk. Some large trees on the north side had fallen over, showing how sandy the soils are. another oddly colored wild rose. This one is almost completely white. This fallen tree, pretty impressive. Chasm would make a pretty good uh, hideout from the rain. And then this fallen one basically formed a living wall. Here's a view of some of the plants living at the top of the wall. And if you thought I was exaggerating about the mosquitoes, here's proof that they were following our every move. This gazebo in the middle of the natural area would make for a nice place to relax in the shade. This dark berry, despite its unusual appearance, is edible. On our way back, we reached an area with a large number of silverberry bushes with their silvery leaves. And yes, this is poop. My apologies to anyone who's eating, but I was fascinated by the butterflies. They sometimes obtain nutrients from sources like this in wet, sandy areas. And here's the white rose I mentioned earlier. And one final look at the sandy soils and flowers. And white roses in there too. Unfortunately, it was time to head back and move on. Next time, we'll take a tour of another location, just slightly south of here, but with an equally interesting history. As always, thanks for watching.